Hello, I'm Tyler Edlin, and this is the Brush Sauce Theater. I'm finally back after about a two months absence. I'm sorry, I had a lot to go on, but I do have a full length uh, tutorial lecture today. It's about 60 minutes, so those of you looking for something quick uh, may not be for you. But what I'm going to do is take you all the way from my sketch to the full color sketch of my cyberpunk uh, Sega scene here. Now, I do have a link below for a video for for the full length tutorial. This is just part one of four. Hello and welcome. Thank you for uh, checking out my tutorial. Now, I just want to give a disclaimer uh, for this piece. This actually started kind of in class this last term over at CGMA. I run the Fundamentals of Design course, and my student Brooke had submitted an awesome, uh, you know, idea and sketch for a scene she was designing. And I think it was great. I went over, we, we did some feedback for it, but this is kind of where this scene started, and I just wanted to give everybody a little bit of a prelude to that and I, I you know we went in we did some sketches I did this layout and that's kind of the seed for what uh, eventually spun and started you know the image that we're working at uh, and we're looking at uh, today and so yeah so thank you Brooke for the inspiration and this composition again isn't a hundred percent all mine I was working you know alongside Brooke and in a way kind of stole some of that but this also kind of serves as an example that you could you know, because I get this question a lot, how much is too much when it comes to stealing or you know, using someone else's art? That's up to your own moral compass at the end of the day, but I'd just like to show, like even though uh, compositionally the structure is very similar in terms of the setup, they're, they're very, very different images at the end of the day, and that's all, you know, they really do share in common was some of the original kind of key shapes, and you'll You'll see that as we begin to, as I begin to, to draw out uh, and, and map this design out. All right, so we're officially beginning this, and uh, I have a vague idea. I'm using that composition from the student, and I want to basically, at this point in time, just make a cyberpunk scene. I want to practice one. I watched the trailer for the upcoming game. I'm really inspired by it. I really do like the genre. I I've probably made less than three or four cyberpunk images in my entire life, so I'm kind of going with that. And you'll watch some of that struggle play out here, is that ideas in general do start off, you know, f fairly vague, and I try to narrow that down, in essentially increasing that focus as I go. So I'm kind of searching. I don't know what type of structure this is at this point. I know it's high up atop some sort of kind of more mega structure, like a some kind of strut or something to a, a larger building of sorts. And I'm trying to work out that path to it, you know, very much like Brooks' image. Uh, and so that's where the idea is stemming from. And I think this is probably one of the biggest or the largest mistakes I see uh, from uh, less experienced artists or, or students in general is that they either start with the details they have a an emphasis of details at the beginning or you know of course the fundamentals could be completely jacked up but basically a lot of people try to get too literal with things too quickly I feel that if you approach things more abstractly you use much more vague shapes and symbols to represent you know, that, that kind of core uh, idea that you have and try to resolve your design try to resolve your image your storytelling from this abstract point of view first and foremost you'll be able to more more or less objectively tell if things are looking interesting or not then you can go in and add the drama you can add the contrast you can add you know, add those elements those visually appealing elements that can basically hold and keep the viewer for a much longer uh, you know duration and hopefully you know turn them into a fan of yours. That, that's always the goal for a lot of us artists, right? We love to seek uh, recognition for our, our skill, for our efforts, for our interests and our passions. 
And that starts here. Many of my most uh, complicated scenes start off in a very similar way where I'm doing a little bit of searching, I'm trying to balance things out, and I'm only vaguely uh, suggesting what the actual picture is. I'm, I'm definitely like, I again, it started off a bit vague, and I'm not necessarily trying to narrow the whole thing down. I'm trying to narrow down the large uh, shapes in the scene. That is what needs to come first. I'm not worried about my light source. I'm not even tackling perspective. I'm not ad addressing the value structure yet. And uh, of course, I'm not considering these details whatsoever. I don't even know what type of building this is. I'm drawing a couple brown tubes, right? They're just warped cylinders. Those are some sort of pipe, <laughs> some sort of massive industrial uh, elements. But without reference, right, without doing the research, which I have not yet, it I'm making this up out of my head. And that, for the most part, is all I really do want to do at this stage. I'm just trying to uh, feel things out and to and, you know eventually refine what um, is playing out in front of me. So I, again, you just saw me kind of struggle with, do I show like a, a skyline, like a city skyline way off in the distance? Well, I, I do like entertaining that idea. I think it would imply that this building is uh, situated much higher in elevation than uh, what I want it to be. So again, I'm, I'm pulling back a bit on that and I'm certainly, um, trying to work out uh, how interesting these designs were. I, I know I could just stick buildings and signs back there, and I'll have to look reference up more specifically about that as I go. Um, and yeah, that's that's just the nature of this at this early stage. I, I don't want to get caught up. Inherently, I don't want to get caught up on something that's not going to work. And that, you know, drawing things this quick or this loose you know, it's it's a decision because I'm trying not to commit too soon to this. I mean, it's great to have faith in your idea and your vision, but my vision's half there at best with this. I, I really don't know the intricacies of it, and I and I want to keep it that way, you know, by choice. I'm choosing to only explore the design, and that design is made up of, uh, for me, just four categories at this point. It's made up of lines. These lines are going on, you, know, you combine them, and they're making shapes. Eventually, these shapes, you know, they could be used maybe to, to suggest form, but there's also, you know, nice ratios of those shapes. There's big, medium, and small shapes. There's um, a hierarchy of those. So, like, uh, I do fewer big shapes, uh, you know, a little bit more medium, and then, of course, there'll be a lot more room for the, the smaller shapes. The other key ratio I really do like to play into this design factor is the 80-20 or the 70-30 rule. There's not really like, it's not really a rule and it's not really uh, something that's set in stone, of course, but I, I do try to use that ratio in regards to my design as much as I can. So that means, all right, if 70% of this image will eventually be in uh, in the darkness or, or shadow, then I'll do 30% light or maybe... Uh, this walkway starts from 70% over to the left from the right, and it's going up, you know, towards the house at about the 70% marker, you know, uh, in in terms of the verticality of the scene. So I'm trying to in, basically incorporate that ratio as often as I can. I just like that ratio personally. Not everybody does it, and not everybody certainly adheres or has to, but I know for me it, it tends to yield fairly good and positive results. And that's something I can count on. So I'm going with it. So see, I'm, I am searching. I'm like, what is the setup of this? I, I'm trying to make these lines and, and shapes support the building uh, as that focal point. And I think that's a great place to start or a great way to look at things, right? What is the focal point doing? And how can I use everything else in the scene to support that first and foremost as being the main attraction of the scene. I need to transport the viewer, bring them into the scene, you know, take them around, give them a tour, 
and get them, you know, get them to want to commit to the image. I want them to bounce their eye all around, lead them in, lead them out. It's like a, a needle and thread. I, I don't want it so linear that I'm just tossing them straight toward the focal point that, you know, they look at it and then they're just gone. Like, it is good to use these, you know, visual paths like uh, or literal paths like this walkway in the scene that i highlighted in in bright purple there that is a literal path in the scene where it's an area where characters can walk it can lead the viewer's eye in and around and out um, and then there's visual paths things that are a little more suggestive or implied something the way like the the uh, wires or the cords you know up the power lines up in the upper image kind of just sway casually right into the, the antenna situated on the uh, the top of the house there. And I think that's a fine way to start. Um, at this point, I do want to, um, I'm gonna enlarge the canvas. I kind of like how the shapes are working. Some of it's resolved, some of it's not, but um, I'm essentially getting everything that I just did. I actually kind of mapped out the perspective to it using some free <laughs> perspective brushes I found on Google. You know, basically up everything, and now I can start to construct the foundation, you know, for the remainder of the image. And this is essentially what this entire first hour, this entire first video is about, is really that first 20 to 25 percent of this entire image making process. It is the most important part of the image making process and it is the part that students either overlook or struggle with the most it is the foundation for the entire image um, and it has to be correct it has to be firm you know and solid it really does have to structurally work you know of course abstractly is great and but you know just in terms of readability you know and the finding and establishing the relationship of shapes exploring whether or not there's positive and negative space. All these are just fundamentals of art that I'm trying to utilize within, you know, a given kind of process or range. So uh, I'm going layer by layer, chunk by chunk, and making very vague cutouts of that sketch. So see, these shapes are very simplistic, essentially a kindergartner, could cut them out and you know a young child and that's how simple i really do like to start i and if i start there and i'm happy with it then i'll go on to subtly add complexity to things as it needs it now there's to say everything should have balance to it you know according you know well that's how i like to do design i like to bring balance to it how do i achieve balance i like to have some things that are simple i like to have some things that are complex I like to have some things that are, are implied, maybe a little softer, some things that are very hard and very firm. Uh, and so I'm beginning to tackle with that fundamental right now. I'm still tackling these lines and these shapes, but I'm refining them. I'm having them try to make a little bit more visual sense. Of course, now, you know, retroactively adding the perspective that makes you know this part a little bit easier and here's one of the techniques that I that I covered it's um, in the extras video where I use this silhouette extraction technique on a photograph you know photographic elements so I can get uh, you know higher density of detail out of these shapes something that I probably typically wouldn't draw if I draw my shapes are generally simple so this helps me you know, get better results and quicker results and very accurate results and it varies things up. So this was some kind of old farm equipment, uh, you know, it was some kind of industrial crane. And that now helped me establish that top part, uh, you know, to be a little bit more dynamic. And yes, this is, this was held uh, a good part of the, good part of this, um, demonstration was held in class and so occasionally I must say you'll see the the class chat uh, pop up there and I, I do like to do a few of these live demonstrations you know every term and I, I record them like I am today sometimes I reuse them in in uh, later classes sometimes you know if I don't like them I'll just publish them online vice versa I love to have a, a massive library 
a video footage archive so I can demonstrate things to students as uh, you know as need be. And of course, it never hurts to have a well-rounded amount of uh, techniques, approaches, and uh, subject matters. And like I said before, this is not a subject matter I tackle all that often. So yes, this is absolutely something I wanted to save and document, you know, hopefully to benefit you guys watching now. So I'm going vaguely off those shapes I, I sketched and I started earlier on, and I'm again using those simple blocks, right? These are these are squares, you know, by extension rectangles, and of course triangles. And using the same technique I previously used on the antenna array, I can use this extracted um, rooftop, uh, I believe it was from Shanghai, and I'm basically, I filled it with the value, you know, I locked the pixel so I have to stay in the lines, and I just filled it with that solid gray. And now I can just do a little bit of warping to, you know, at least semi-match this perspective. And I'm searching around to try to have it overlap some of those core shapes that I've already established. Again, I don't want the whole thing to be as complex as that. And I don't want it to be as simple. But I, I figured, you know, if I just darken that up a little bit and layer it down, I could probably even have it fit into some of those elements. So I'm actually using it in two areas. So I, I copy and pasted it. I want to use that little side skit right there that I just filled in for that detail. And I'm, you know, that's up a little bit more. And I'm, I'm reusing uh, the rest of it uh, on the uh, right side there. Now I'm basically just going to merge both of those shapes down to that shape I started with. I do like to work, you know, you'll see the PSD those of you that got the full version of this, um, I, I did keep the layers. And it's a little bit more busy than my typical file. Uh, but I kept a lot of the signs and the graphics and stuff on their own layers. But I do try to simplify things, believe it or not, as much as I can. And here I am dropping, uh, I believe it was part of a, a site construction with you know, some, some antennas as well. And I don't want to use all the information, but I do like a hint of that uh, complexity and, and, of course, density of information, you know, a little bit here and there. Why not? So it, it I think it complements my nice <laughs> rectangles and triangles fairly well. Right, so now we can see the hint of some sort of high rise, high rises in the back. Maybe some of them are under construction. Maybe they're not. I don't know. I'll, I'll work out that later. I really am just trying to establish these shapes, these proportions, and these relationships. Um, now, I, again, I have my mind firmly in a graphic design or a design standpoint right now. I'm, I'm just coming in the back and I'm filling in with a light shape just because it pops very easily. I'm trying to fill in the negative space. So I'm, you know, part of me is interpreting that very ugly rough colored line sketch and part of me is trying to feel out what's working best at the moment. As I've said in previous videos, I don't think there's ever such thing as a perfect composition. Um, there's no solid textbook answer like this is right or this is wrong. And usually, you know, for those of you that have been with me in any of my terms or my classes, is I, I like to approach designs. And it is such a subjective thing as, again, it's not right or wrong, but it's what is better or worse, you know, for what you're trying to say, what you're trying to express. And for, for me now at that moment, that's kind of how I was approaching. It's like, yes, I feel like this negative shape works very well right now. I'm actually taking another random graphic scrap from a uh, high rise building and I'm using it in a vertical way to just get a little information out of there like that. I, I love doing things like that. I, mean, you know, I kit bash my own photo um, shapes just to make them a little more fresh and, and interesting. And see, very easily you can yield very uh, complex shapes. But again, they, they first worked as those squares and rectangles. I, I can't stress that enough. And so, I, again, I'm not really balancing lighter. This is basic atmospheric perspective stuff where I'm just letting things get lighter as they recede into the background. 
there that can be associated with a form of light. It could be ambient light. I but I I know I'm not going to end up there. For now, it just helps me sort through and look at these shapes. And again, this is um, this is a bit of a workflow I've used a few times, but I'm not, you know, I don't, it's not like a go-to workflow. It's not like a workflow I use for every type of image. I've never really constructed, for example, a medieval scene with this workflow. I just haven't. I just approach it a little differently. And I'm saying this because I, I, I wholeheartedly believe like it, it, it's in many students or many best artists, uh, interests to have multiple approaches to solving design problems and of course to construct images and and I, I know from my experience some techniques just work really good you know over others for certain genres for certain types of images and so when I get a, a job for a client or I have a demo lined up for a class like this it's I, I, I can you know go internally in that Rolodex of things I've tried in the past and like you know how did that work what worked? You know, what have I done before to work on an image similar? What's worked? What hasn't worked? And I can make these decisions to adapt a workflow that you know, not only works, you know, fairly quick, but is efficient in how it constructs. I, I want to do the least backpedaling as possible. We've all been there. We've all done that. We're right. We we we're retreading and repainting lots and lots of parts of the image. Um, and that's fine. And that's part of the growing process. It's part of the artistic process. But of course, in, in, if we're speaking about raw efficiency, right, it, it is about doing the, the least amount of backtracking uh, possible. And that's what I'm trying to do in this scene. And I, there's a few instances, and I'll call it out when I do do that. But uh, for the most part, this image, you know, it went very quick. I think a total of eight hours or less and very little backtrack. I never had to repaint anything, really. Um, I mean, again, there'll be an exception. I'll show you. But for the most part, it was always taking that forward moving uh, momentum. And for those wondering, you know, what am I doing here? And I'm, I'm sculpting out graphic uh, shapes with very opaque shape brushes. There's no opacity uh, turned on with them. And there's no, um, is it, or that's the transfer mode, I believe in newer versions of Photoshop. It, they're just blocky, they're crisp, they're clean. And I'm just exploring graphic shapes that I could potentially do to light up signs and uh, billboards in the background much later on. They'll simply serve as placeholders for now as I'm kind of, you know, organizing and constructing my thoughts and, you know, the literal val value structure of the image. Yeah, it's efficiency moving forward, right? Where, you know, where was I? Um, and that's often what the beginner artist you see the most is they, they don't understand all the fundamentals. They might know a few, they, they, and, it, and maybe they do understand some, that they don't know how to employ them efficiently in a way that they're just getting very quick and direct results. And, um, you know, that's, that's the difference between, you know, the, um, beginner and then the intermediate artists. Most of the artists I do work with kind of do fall more or less into that intermediate level. A lot of them, you know, we, we established this early on, you do you understand light? Do you understand, maybe not all the properties of light, but do you kind of understand like <laughs> when there's a lit surface, you're going to have, you know, light on one side, it's going to have shadow on the other, it might cast a shadow, you know, understanding the basics. Uh, you may understand, of course, a little bit of perspective and uh, form and how to use lines and stuff. But uh, what the intermediate artist often struggles with and what they're usually good at, they can deal, you know, when you when you put them to the test or when you really look at, you know, what they're doing in an image, they do know how to under, understand and they, they do know how to work with these art fundamentals on an individual basis. Their struggle does come when they try to overload themselves and tackle multiple uh, key fundamentals at once. When they're dealing with color, when they're dealing with lighting, when they're dealing with value, and when they're working out the design all at once, and I, I see this every week, every term, um, people just basically, you know, artists bite off more than they can chew, more than they can understand at once. It's like when you 
maybe have like an old computer and you're trying to run the newest game on it. It's, you know, so some of the settings like, no, just handle it in a very simple way. And then you try to crank up the graphics and get all these fancy effects. It's very similar to that. Um, with them, you know, the, the student's mind can only comprehend or understand, you know, bites and chunks of this information, but they're trying to take on and tackle much, much more uh, in, in a very unforgiving way. Uh, and when they're when they do do that, there is a struggle, right? And that struggle is, you know, dealing with these fundamentals effectively, so that they are keeping that forward momentum. And I and that's where I see, you know, many many students they're constantly painting and repainting things uh, because they're they're fumbling or they don't understand how X or Y is working, and they have to go back and redo and redo. Uh, so. That's kind of why I'm, I'm doing a very safe approach to this. I'm just tackling one aspect of design, one fundamental, one challenge at a time. And I said that very early on in my very earliest videos, you know, the, uh, the, um, the Asian red floating city that a lot of people found my work on YouTube for. It's like, you know, simple, you know, complex tasks can be broken down into very small manageable chunks. And that's essentially what I recommend and I help students with the most. It's like, where are the problem areas? How can we like fix these? And let's fix them just one at a time. Let's not overwhelm anybody. That, that, that's the, and again, that's the difference between a good and a bad teacher. I feel like a bad, a bad instructor will not be as conscientious of you know what the student is capable of and will overwhelm them. And, and that has got to be where the line is drawn, is not overwhelming you know, that student with too, too many ideas. And that's why, you know, an idea is the place to start, but you know, how do you represent that idea with simple blocks, with simple shapes? Think back, right, to when you're a child and you have a tub of blocks. There is only rectangles, there's cylinders, um, maybe there's, of course, some boxes, you know, some squares. Um, and a child's imagination is more than equipped. It's more than enough to build worlds, tell stories and and essentially you know form these narratives and these ideas with very simple shapes and that's part of what you know a good artist a good good designer can do is they can tap back into that inner child imagination and mindset and make something work with very little pieces you know very few pieces and again that you know that's kind of like the theme of this first part is is that the Right, the student tries to get too literal too quickly. Oh, how does this house look? What is the material of this house? How do these rails, you know, all look? Is it metal? Is it shiny? These are things that I would highly recommend not even avoid tackling it. Just represent it with a square and a rectangle. Call it a day there. Eventually, if that shape is readable, okay, let's talk about that light source, right? Is this ambient light or is it direct light? And you build, the, you start building that value structure up around what the focal point is. You know, one thing at a time. Um, and I, I, I think a lot of professionals. That's what you know, from what I see and from the ones that I talk with, they, they have that streamlined, you know, into their workflow, and they can tell you at any point in the process, of course, you know, what and how and why a certain shape or a specific pattern or how they're developing a rhythm of things. And there's a reason for everything and they can break down and explain that to you. And again, I've seen this at least three times this week where I was looking and critiquing student work and you know, we'd be in a Skype call or something. And I'm like, okay, so this is what I'm seeing here. And I would say, why is, you know, for instance, there was a medieval scene and I'm like, okay, you have your main character writing down. And I said, you know, why is the rest of the street why is the rest of the scene empty? Is it intentional that the scene is completely devoid of life? And you're like, no. Um, oh, I, I don't know. I didn't think of that. And that's why, like, they, they just there's not an answer for everything. And a professional would be able to supply that answer, or then maybe they even BS one, right? Oh, it's a, it's a ghost town there. The the plague wiped them out. They're all hiding. You know, you could, you could have a very specific design reason for such um, a narrative. And so yes, I'm using that um, polygonal marquee tool there. I make I make these selections. This is the walkway shape, right? And it's its own little group. 
and I'm just glazing, you know, some value across it with an airbrush. I know this has been much more theory over technique. And of course, that's been intentional too. Techniques come and go. They're throwaway. They're, on, they're constantly changing. Some of you that, you know, by some chance stumble upon this, you know, three, maybe even ten years after I originally publishing it. Yeah, I'm sure the techniques will work, but I'm sure there's much more. I'm sure maybe even I'm using much more efficient ones. Uh, technique, techniques are not as as timeless. Of course, some of them are. Some things always do work, but they're constantly evolving. Technology is constantly evolving, but the idea and the theory of things that that's always going to be. That's the constant, and that's kind of why I'm kind of focusing more on that. And the remainder of the videos will be, I feel, uh, in this series for this this image will be a little more uh, technique based. But I, I thought I'd, it'd be a little more beneficial to give some of the hows and the whys first, rather than this is how you do this, then this is how you do this, and then I don't say anything for five minutes and say, oh, this is how... Because I'm doing the same thing. I'm using graphic brushes and sculpting shapes, and I'm still keeping them vague. Like, that's a rectangle. It's going to represent a sign. At this point, I didn't even know what type of building it is. Is it going to be a gun shop? Is it going to be a rebel hideout? Is it going to be a... Yeah, I don't know. Is it going to be a food, a food shack? Item store for an RPG? I don't know. I actually, like, I was thinking about it, and I couldn't process that yet. I, I just, again, my, my mind is simple as it is. I could not even, I couldn't deal with working out some of these elements. And that's why I'm keeping them vague. And I can get specific with these as I move forward. Yeah, I used, um, for, like, that graphic on the left kind of just rambled through that. I used the shape tools and I would just use positive and negative shapes or I used a vector, you know, just to make abstract uh, shapes and then I would skew it into perspective. And I did that on the buildings in that lower right corner as well. It's a very clean and quick way to get a little mileage out of, out of that shape tool. Maybe help keep things very clean and organized. See, here's the uh, ellipse. So see, I duplicated that, and essentially what I'm doing on the fly is building assets, reusable assets within the scene. So I keep, you know, the benefit of this is it's saving time, it's going to help my, my shapes be consistent, and they'll be clean, and they'll be on their own layer. So there's a lot of benefits to doing this. What I'm doing is I'm designing the railing that's going to be wrapping around the majority of this. Because everything needs to be designed, and and that again, that's something I see a lot of students not do. They'll just have a few arbitrary shapes, or they won't even have a railing in some cases. I was like, do you know this is, you know, like 18 stories up in the air? There, there, you know, city regulations, state regulations. You know, maybe there's probably going to be a walkway. Someone, someone's going to get sued. You know, so you gotta gotta put your practicality, and that's all it is. It's like thinking of the logistics of some things can solve a lot of design problems. So I'm making some patterns, copy and paste them, and again warping them into perspective where I need them. Reusing. Saves lots of time. And see, just uh, using the skew tool, warping them wherever I need them, wherever I wherever I beckon them, they, they'll be there, and they're very clean. And I can paint behind them, I can paint in front of them, and it keeps it rather clean. So see, I like when I was doing that initial line sketch, you know, that's very messy. I I wasn't working out the design of each individual little thing like this. I couldn't even process that. I don't. I don't. I respect you if you can, but I, I couldn't. I, I, this is something I'm thinking up of on the fly as the design problem presents itself, right? And there was a problem. I need a railing. I don't have one. Okay, let's design the railing out at this point. Just call it a day. And that's part of the organic process. So, again, I, I, I 
was saying earlier, I do like to resolve a lot of the major things in the scene early on, you know, that first 25%. But I mean, there's still plenty that hasn't been resolved, but the foundations there, that that never changes. And we'll see that, you know, come into play at the end of this video. I'm going to show the final color sketch compared, you know, to what the final image looks like. There's not really a difference. You can't even tell if you were looking at it across the room, and that's the idea. Right now, um, I am developing, I'm building another asset. I want to, I want to use pipes in the scene. So I'm, you know, I use these very dirty little tricks here like this to build like a, a graphic sphere where the lighting may or may not be. I, it's it's guess. I, it's going to be a quick way for me to do it. I need to edit this though. I use the the sliders, but I'll I'll just push, you know, some of that form a little bit more, and then manually paint in a little bit of uh, bounce light. You know, adding a adding a firm highlight because it's going to be metallic, and then adding some of that bounce light in the shadow, because there's lights going to be bouncing all over the scene. So I just want to cover my cover my ground with the sphere. And basically, I'm going to use the Mixer Brush tool. I'm going to hit Alt over this, make sure the brush is big enough to capture it all. And then I can drag and drop. And basically, it's like instant cords or instant pipes anywhere I need them. And so again, just another dirty trick to get results quickly and then reusing assets. And of course, if you're working 3D, that's what you're doing too. You're building one little thing and you reuse it as many times as, as necessary. You don't re rebuild the same little iron bar, you know, the, the strut or the support, 19 times you build one and reuse it. And see, it's, you can see it's lagging right there. I had the uh, smoothing turned on. That's okay. Got to shut that off. So you just drag. But it, it does a very good job at just capturing what a tube, you know, what a pipe would look like, a cylinder warped in perspective. So I try, I'm having fun. I play with that a couple times. I try a few different settings. And um, I realize it's going to be a little difficult to get that perspective. So I do just paint it and then I, I warp and skew it to, to fake some of that perspective. See, I, I just select it. I made a separate layer for it. And now I'm just faking that perspective just a little bit. Now I can move it. Of course, put it where I want it to be. It's going to be under that bridge. So again, I since the bridge is on its own layer, I can hit Command or Control to select it, and then just remove it from that. And this is the first real indication of lighting I did. I put a shadow over the bottom or the base of that pipe. And I'm adding a highlight to this. I really haven't addressed lighting in any sort of degree up to this point whatsoever. So those would be the cast shadows in that situation anyway. So you're trying, you're trying to toggle or toy with that idea of using these little, little smaller pipes too and stuff, but um, a lot of it gets lost in the in the final anyway. But at the point, at that time, I thought, yeah, you know, while I have this asset out and selected, I'll just try to knock out a few pipes, cylinders, AC vents, anything, anything along those lines. So yeah, I did put this massive sort of pipe up there. It was like a water tank. Maybe it's like a boiler. I don't know. Haven't haven't really done my research, and that's that's why I did not exactly have an answer. I liked that that cylinder was on there because I felt that it, it it rested in that area very well, and it switched up the shapes. I like there's a square next to it. There's a triangle. So I wanted to complete the trifecta, but I I didn't literally know what it was, but I liked it as a primitive shape. I liked it right there. I 
now I'm just uh, sculpting out uh, a sign that I originally had drawn in this area. I don't know what type of sign, but I'm just playing with the idea of having a fun shape for that sign. And, you know, that's the best I can do at this stage, is just kind of work out some of these graphic elements. I don't even think I light up the square in front of it. Like, I totally just save it for later. Um, the other thing I, I am trying to sort of accomplish with this image is that typically where it, with street scenes or with city scenes with uh, man-made geometric things every you know everything that this sort of is um we have perspective every uh, typically a, or a lot of student artists a lot of artists have everything be perpendicular everything's either going vertically up and down or horizontally left and right maybe you know according to that perspective so, uh, you know, like with the ramp, like with the angles on the signs, I'm trying to improvise or create situations where I can go against and change up the angles in the scene so it doesn't feel quite as flat or calculated or stiff. And so it's essentially just trying to change the axis, um, the axis of many of the objects in the scene. And I go back to the pipes. Like, I don't know what's going on. This be, uh, I have a large pipe, so I'm trying to have a bunch of smaller pipes, you know, run um, behind this uh, walkway. I thought it filled in the area, of, you know, pretty nice. And notice I'm constantly redrawing some of these lines. Uh, not because not I'm a perfectionist, but I do want it to look right. I'm not, th at no point would I say this is ever a race. I'm not just blindly or arbitrarily just throwing things down because I think it's making my image go quicker and getting me to the next area. But I'm, I'm constantly just you know, going at a leisurely pace to think about every mark I'm making and seeing if it's the mark I do want. Is it the mark I don't want? Uh, and I'm being, you know, a little bit, a little bit picky or selective with it. So you're kind of just taking that, um, that big graphic shape at the time, you know, back there. I was like, I'll do many little signs. I'll, I'll break this down. You know, I'll put a bunch of ads there, you know, something like that. Again, I'll, I'll work out what that is later. But at, at this point, I'm just trying to make fun, fun shapes out of those, those graphics. Let's see if I have a graphic there. It allows me to sell the silhouette of that building just a little bit. And this is the other thing I do, right? Uh, reusing assets. I'm making window sets that I can use on those background uh, shapes. They are not really buildings yet. They'll become buildings when I put these lines and these shapes uh, back there. But I have to get to that. And that's what, you know, that's that next part, you know, of the, the image making process. You know, where things do get a lot more dynamic. I, I do start to add that drama and the, the actual tangible you know, semantic level of details. Very basic level, but it starts, right, we're literally giving things associations now. Like, this square is no longer a square. It's a, it's a line of windows. And it, you know, the size of them can show, oh, this building's way off, you know, back there. And, of course, the angle says, oh, yes, this is a very angular building it's in perspective so I'm, I'm intentionally going not against any of the perspective lines that I previously drawn just the vertical ones so I can make sure at least uh, the three-point perspective is accurate So 
So now I'm even changing up individual faces of these to show that you know the building is changing uh, shape constantly. It's a complex form. And I can show that it's a complex form just by changing the angle of these windows. Maybe even adding a round area. And so now I can just move that asset around very non-destructively till it kind of just, you know, I could say in my, to myself, hey, this looks good, or this looks about right. I, I'm, I'm happy with that. And I'm not a perfectionist, but I just, I just want it to feel good at the moment. It is its own shape at this point. I could go back and adjust it if I need, or I could even reuse it. So changing the angle again. And I'll have to, you know, stretch that out a little bit. So yeah, this started off as a, just a straight one, you know, singular rectangle, but now it's selling the shape of this entire building, you know, that's far, far off in the distance. And now I can duplicate that to add detail to the bottom. Keeps it clean, keeps it simple, keeps it moving forward. And I'll do this a few times, just, just to kind of switch gears up and uh, try a few different things. But yeah, the, the attention, intention, at this point was just to kind of make a fun cyberpunk sort of environment and scene um, and it you know wasn't quite yet uh, you know that I decided to go very heavy in the Sega fanboy direction um, and that brings me to this other topic I wanted to address at this point and that was I was struggling with art block at and a very on a very micro scale a very minimal scale we all do experience this, and some of us, you know, better or worse, we, we do experience it greater at some points than others, and it comes and goes. It's normal. We all deal with it. Um, but I didn't know what was, like, that hook for the scene. It was just that generic cyberpunk scene. It, it lacked, I'm not going to say it, but maybe I am going to say it, it kind of lacked that heart or that spirit. I don't want to say soul, but it, it lacked a little bit of that something, something. <laughs> and I knew that, and I, I couldn't put my finger on how to resolve that yet. And again, what mistake the student usually makes is they'll, and myself many times too, I'll just type in cyberpunk images, cyberpunk environment, Neo Tokyo, I'll go to the internet, I'll start looking outward to try to fix that problem. Oh, what did somebody else do? Or what happened in this movie? And that is not the best way to go about it. At best, you'll competently just copy something else, like inherently, and, and maybe it'll work, maybe it will even mean something, You maybe it won't, maybe it'll just get you through the actual image, but um, that's the big mistake, right, that when we get stuck at things, we just look outward, we go to Facebook, we go to Instagram, um, when, when, I, when I solve the problem, what I did, and this is what I recommend, is look within, you know, walk away and that's what I did I'd walked away for like a day or so I thought about things right because I, I did I have to walk my dog I have to walk my baby I'm constantly going out and you know in the in the world but in a, if it's a quiet street I live on a quiet street it's peace and quiet I have a lot of it's the only time I can get some headspace and I was just thinking about things and you know when I got back you know, still nothing was like clicking but I got I had got one of these Sega Dreamcast games in the mail on eBay I had ordered just you know a week and a half or so prior and then it just clicked right there it's like 
this is what it is. I am obsessed with, like, old Sega. I'm obsessed with new... I love Sega. Like, how can I make a cyberpunk Sega scene? Let's make a tribute. Let's make... You know, let, 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 let's go all in on this. Let's make this the Sonic Sega Clubhouse, the club spin. Let's let's make this a old, you know, like if the, if a, if in the movie Akira, there was a cyberpunk scene and there was a Sega bar, barcade, I don't know, whatever you call it, like, how would that look? And how would that celebrate 30, my 30 years of being a fan of that company? And then it just started, to, it just flow, it flowed out so naturally from there and it all came from my passion you know first and foremost as a gamer as a Sega fan I got so many ideas it was a battle to filter them out at that point out and that's because it came from within the answer wasn't on Google it wasn't online I really just had to sit in my chair and look around I was surrounded by Sega stuff and that's what got it out of me all right, so for this next step, the, 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 the students in class, I was like, I don't know how to color this from here. What's the plan? They're like, someone's like, use a color layer. I'm like, oh, I haven't used a color layer in ages. I'm not sure I'm going to do this. And I just did it. I was like, let's fill it with purple. Put the mode on color. And I was like, yeah, yeah I can kind of feel this. My value structure is holding it. Not holding it as well as I want at this point, but yeah, that could be adjusted. And I just started to ride that way from there. I was, again, just having multiple workflows, switching gears, trying things you don't necessarily try every week is a great way to grow. It's a great way to try different types to approach your art. It's a different way to get a fresh look to your images. And that's what this is. There's a lot of similarities, technically speaking, to this in my previous works, but it does have a bit of freshness to it, I like to think. That's some of my work lately, you know, because I did a lot of natural scenes, a lot of medieval scenes that, you know, this kind of brings to the table. And that's because I was trying different techniques, different approaches. And my cl my my class was challenging me, you know, as the instructor to go with these things. And I, I just go do it. And it was a lot of fun. It really was. And so I'm just trying and adapting and shifting these colors around. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how they'll work out. And... You know, that's going to take us, you know, into the next video. Uh, but uh, this is going to end with just kind of coming up with a color comp. And eventually I do come up with three different color comps. And that is because we can't have color without these values. These values are making these colors come very quick and very easy. Uh, you can't have a nice painting without color. That's for sure. But you can't have a color painting without the value structure. The value structure has to have some sort of solid foundation you know coming full circle back that the whole video here it's about that work on that foundation structure the, sh the scenes with lines eventually with shapes eventually with value one by one things will come together if you don't skip ahead if you don't overlook things you take it slow you taste it you take it in a systematic way things can come together and now i can toggle sliders move things around and the color starts to resonate and speak with itself. Eventually, I couldn't make up my mind initially. I had to go back on the Nintendo Switch, of all things. Play some more Sonic Mania Plus. just came out. And I watched that opening cinema boot up again. And there, it was just fantastic. I was like, wow, this is a kind of exactly what I'm envisioning here. I'll make a Sega Land or a Sega World. But it'll be cyberpunk. It'll be, it'll be fun. And that... Again, that's what really just set off the inspiration for these colors, you know, these bombastic colors, these insanely oversaturated colors that I typically don't go with in my forest scenes or my beach scenes or my mountain scenes. It, it lets me have fun, play with, and explore these colors at the other end of the color wheel that I typically don't get to utilize as much as I'd like to. And so see, now I'm working shapes within a shapes. It's one of those primary design techniques. I'm subdividing. I'm subdividing these negative shapes into smaller shapes. And I'm doing that with this insanely bright yellow. And I'm trying, again, from an abstract standpoint, 
can I make these smaller shapes interesting? And can I not make it less distracting? Or can I not make it more distracting, rather? I'm just trying to imply the tops of buildings far, far off into the distance. So this is still, it's not monochromatic. I do have a couple shades of purple, but we're also, of course, now going with yellow. So it's fairly highly um, complementary in its color scheme. But what color is next to yellow or is in, the, in a relative family? It is, it, it is the greens and then the blues. So I'm going to have a few greens, you know, not, not a crazy amount. I want to limit them. And eventually I want that Sega. I know, you know I'm going to make that building a Sega clubhouse, an arcade. I'm going to make it blue, right? Just like the mighty Sega logo. So I'm going to have that spectrum of colors subtly get me to there from these crazy purple magenta uh, hues that I'm going with at first. But I want them to be fairly warm purples. I do want the background to feel a little bit on the warmer side because that that arcade that my major house the focal point I want it I want it harder I want it cooler I want it edgier and so I'm trying to contrast that in the background by using warmer colors they'll be a little bit softer in shapes um, they'll feel a little bit safer more angles in the front blockier sturdier I'm utilizing these design core principles these elements of contrast you know value shape proximity I've covered them in previous videos. It's a great way to maximize contrast, essentially adding drama to the scene and, you know, hopefully, you know, getting people to respond and, you know, resonate with the image. Of course, you know, with that said, there's going to be Nintendo fans out there. There's going to be people that don't like Sega as a company, but you know what? At the end of the day, it's for me, and I personally feel it's um, better to make something that somebody doesn't like than not have it noticed at all, right? That's the biggest art crime. That's the biggest deep fear. Like we, we go, we make this masterpiece, we make this painting, and just nobody notice it. It just, it kind of just is forgotten. So i rather, you know, I'd rather make something crazy, eye-catching, you know, there, of course, there'll be there'll be haters. There are people I, that don't care for it, and that's fine. But I, you know, as long as it, as long as it gets noticed to some degree or another, you know, that's more important to me. I can reach out and connect with other fans. But yeah, this is I'm I'm putting some very superficial color ideas. Uh, just on the top of this to kind of plan this out. And this is before I was going 100% with the blue variant. And, you know, well, that'll kind of kick us off at the uh, the next video, the next part. But this is going to kind of end that, you know, the, the version I'm putting up on YouTube. So if you made it this far, thank you very much. If you do enjoy my content, do subscribe. I, I haven't been able to post regularly, but when I do, I, you know, I try to make good content. So... Thank you for any kind of support you have given or shown me. I appreciate that. If you have any questions about the, the entire product or just about what I've covered here today, leave it in the comments below. And of course, if you are going to purchase this, I humbly thank you, you know, ahead of time here on the channel. So take care.